I am a Google developer expert in machine learning, and I am also a Raza contributor, and I've been doing chatbots for living for two years now. And today I will talk about conversational design choices that you can make to enhance your NLU capabilities from scratch. Uh, this is this is actually something like best practices kind of things that I have observed. I have never had any seniors. This is me. I have never had any seniors and the way I have approached all of the problems uh, across the bots I have made uh, was kind of benchmarking stuff and going along with it. So. There are a few know-hows that I want to tell today. Uh, these are the bots I have done so far. Uh, the first bot I have ever done was called Buck. It was a customer support for uh, medium-sized service companies. You could um, you could basically uh, schedule some uh, services, reschedule or cancel or talk about you know, a problem running in your house, it can be about your plumbing system, it can be about ACs, it can be about um, heating. Uh, it was a narrow domain one, to be honest, and it was rather easy to handle. I have made many mistakes in doing that at the first place. Currently, I'm doing a wider domain bot, and it is very challenging to do. Uh, and I have some observations about that. The bot I'm currently doing is SID, and it is basically about, we have this research team that is researching the life quality index, and every single user we have has have their own life qualities, and uh, this app basically recommends you things that can enhance your life quality, and it also comes with the conversational agent, and it is kind of a friend and making a friend is really challenging so i am going to handle everything like tips and tricks uh, according to a model life cycle approach so first one is the data collection so what if you don't have any data uh, i have collected some uh, data sources uh, one is uh, there are human machine and human human dialogue data sets uh, this is uh, coming from a paper called A Survey Avail of Available Corpora for Building Data-Driven Dialogue Systems. So there is this task, Dialogue State Tracking Competition, I guess, and it's about Dialogue State <laughs> Tracking. Uh, it is basically about intent prediction and it has many data sets inside. Uh, it has a, this, um, this, website basically has everything in the in every single domain like hotel reservation uh restaurant booking system bus ride information system anything it it also has some human human dialogue data sets and another thing i have tried so far was um in the in this seed we have few questions we have few uh dom questions that can be asked uh, for bug, for instance, uh, we had some data previously from the live support, but what if I didn't have it? So I have basically used uh, language models, uh, specifically T5 language model of Google, to uh, ask few questions, and I have let it paraphrase on the task of core question pairs. Like, for instance, the original query in here is what to do when my basement is flooding. There are some paraphrasing in there, and this is one of the best ways I have ever come across uh, to use synthetic data. This is actually not really synthetic because you are using language models. There are other uh, synthetic data sources like uh, markdown tools, which I don't suggest using. Uh, this one is a safer approach if you don't have any data, uh, if you don't have any previous dialogue data that you can utilize. And uh, another thing I have seen to be helpful is visualizing your intents, what are, what are lying in your embeddings, aka what lies TM. <laughs> So uh, I have I've been using Butlice for a while now, and because I have this 
friend-like conversational agent, it's a really challenging task. For instance, we have these three intents that I have found very challenging. One is about, I cannot sleep. The other one is about, uh, I'm always sleepy and tired. And the other one is about, I'm going to bed, I am very sleepy. And all of the responses to these are actually different. But it's hard to handle because you basically have to think TFIDF. So uh, what lies has helped me to visualize what is going on, which, are, which intents are close to each other and which are far from each other, which one I have to make more distinct in a TFIDF sense. So uh, I have actually, yeah. It also helps you visualize them very uh, in an interactive way. So I have found it very useful. Always visualize your intents. They really help. Uh, you can also develop sort of, uh, you know, KNN like uh, fallback mechanism. Like you can have a language model and you can get your intense vectors out of it. And when a user input comes, you can basically locate it inside that vector space and get the closest intent as the predicted one uh, uh, with cosine similarity if it falls into fault. This is also one of the things I have come across uh, and I have uh, handled the fallback split. And if it's if there is no close intent, you can like determine a threshold. If there is no closer intent, then you can simply uh, say, hey, I didn't get it, can you rephrase? You also have to think TF-IDF, as I have previously mentioned. Like split on, um, split on entity and merge on intents instead, because these are really, uh, these are small things and you might not have noticed it in your agent, but uh, they really make a difference. So you have to uh, decrease the number of um, mutual words between intents and make them more distinct. Also, something I have come across in here, for instance, do not rely on someone else's stop words. What I have done previously was to uh, get rid of stop words uh, put the stop words back, you know, refine the stop words list and visualize my embeddings again so that I have seen whether if my intents have become um, far or not, uh, were they more distinct or not. Also in uh, wider domain chatbots like mine, like making a friend, most of the uh, stop words actually make sense. And also you need pronouns if you are actually refining your pronouns. Uh, this is one of the things I have come across uh, that were mistakes uh, relying on someone else's stop words. Also, do not flood your uh, do not flood your data set with uh, entities like email or phone number and use Duckling and entity lookup tables instead. Because meanwhile you are doing this, especially most of the people want to augment their data with markdown tools, uh, you know, like giving entities and giving some sort of a template. When you augment it, you you kind of create a bias and this is this becomes a bit problematic. So what I would suggest is like instead of if you have too many entities like I do in my world, uh, use entity lookup tables instead and for the entities like time, email, phone number, use Duckling instead. Also, <laughs> I'm currently making an Arabic chatbot and um, it is really hard. The reason why is that I am using Raz open source. And what I have just realized was that I, as a person, I don't know about Arabic and I thought I would just be able to handle it. We are using Google Translate. There are several approaches in making your bot in a multiple language. And one of them is basically putting a Google Translate before and after the endpoints. Other approach is just making a whole another bot and we have taken that. 
And uh, one of the things, one of the challenges was to annotate entities because uh, right to left languages like Hebrew or Arabic are not supported in VS Code and annotating your entities is incredibly problematic. So I have uh, consulted to this Raza Arabic group and they told me, hey, this is really challenging and uh, there's a whole another tool we have just created. You can take a look at it. So you have to handle right to left languages really carefully if you don't know about them. Uh, and another thing is picking your model for agents with agents with wider domains. What I have uh, observed was using pre-trained embeddings uh, is really helpful. Also using, uh, you know, a model with positional embeddings, just like diet, really increases the performance. And uh, for the agents with narrow domain, you have to go supervise since that. Uh, this is my observation and my benchmarks, but uh, you you need your model to generalize well, and you cannot rely on your own training data always if you have a wider domain chatbot like SIT. Uh, but agents for agents with na narrow domain, most of the time, uh, if you have a really good training data, you can simply go supervise, which is really faster and lightweight as you don't have to deal with a language model like BERT. Speaking of BERT, you can use BERT just like this. Uh, you can simply add it on your pipeline and it's incredibly useful if you have a wider domain chatbot. And also working with non-English language, you have few embedding choices. Uh, byte pair embeddings according to my observation, was really lightweight. Uh, Spacey does not really support so many languages. Uh, on, it has only tokenizer, not the language model for most of the languages that it has. Uh, you can use hugging face models and FastX and Bytepayer has many supports for most of the languages. And during and after training, what I have seen uh, useful was going over the misclassified intents with a cross-validation and actually analyzing their confidences. You know, taking the standard deviation and mean and finding their nice sweet spot for the fallback uh, threshold was really helpful. Uh, though it's not really always the case in the real world, at least you get a grasp of how well your classifier actually performs in your training data. And refining your intents to make, make them more distinct, you know, where seeing where your bot fails and then just training again and maybe determining fallback, um, fallback threshold can also be an option. Another thing I really love about Raza is TensorBoard support, which really helps me out. And tune, for the tuning part, most of the times, uh, one of the mistakes I have made was to change the, for instance, priority of the, um, of the core model. You know, you have policies and you have their priorities. Do not do that if you don't really don't know uh, what you are doing. So most of the times the already existing uh, priority <laughs> works fine. Uh, and also for the hyperparameters of the model, uh, like apply tuning if it's really necessary, not because you think uh, you can make dramatic improvements. Uh, my observation was that default hyperparameters work usually work really well. And also, do I wouldn't suggest you to use generative models. Like for SID, I would go with generative models and just put a generative model and it will talk about anything. But you really don't want to do that as generative models are usually, usually have so many bias inside. Like I have put this as an example, uh, but it gets really ugly at times. Uh, I didn't want to be offensive at all. 
but the woman is always like associated with you know nurses waitresses and men is usually computer scientist ceo someone actually made a nice um nice visualization of all of these biases in this paper man is to computer programmer and wo- as woman is to homemaker the bias in word embeddings a uh, woman is usually associated with homemaker and man is usually associated with you know ceo engineer genius etc uh but i have put this as a way of saying there are stereotypes there are also other biases if you have never investigated them Uh, i'm just saying uh they they can really get offensive and i as a person would never put my uh agent um like just just connect my agent to an inference and point to a generative model i have seen one uh chatbot doing that It's a very popular one and I will not name it but it has turned out to be covid denier and offensive against the race if I have tested it adversarially uh by means of covid denier I I I wanted to say uh covid vaccine denier basically uh so yeah so this is my talk I hope you have enjoyed it